I hope that you will turn with me in a Bible to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. And our focus today will be on verses 13 to 20. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. And let's recall the context here. This is a letter written to Christians undergoing the fires of persecution. Some of them have had their property confiscated, stolen from them. Some of them have been put in prison. And some of them are being threatened with execution itself. They are in desperate straits. So desperate, in fact, that some inside the church have walked away. They've said, this isn't worth it. This isn't what we signed up for. And this is a letter written to encourage God. We can pray to Him. We can turn to Him. We can pour out our hearts to Him. We can turn to Him with confidence and receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. A precious truth. Miracle of all miracles. But in making this point, he enters into a kind of digression, kind of parenthetical comment, beginning at chapter 5, verse 11. Because he says, some of you aren't ready for this truth. Because some of you aren't hearing correctly. You're not hearing correctly because you're not growing. You're not maturing. You're not growing. You're not maturing because you're not thinking correctly. So I need to reorient you to the basics of the gospel. Of what it's really about. I need to remind you of that. And then he continues along this line to say that If we abandon those fundamentals, those basics, those essential truths of the gospel, then we're at risk of passing the point of no return. And this is what we see in chapter 6, verses 4 to 12. He spurs them on to persevere using the negative, using warning to say that there are some in the church who can appear to have saving faith, but it's not real. They've only tasted of the gospel. They only profess to, having, to have saving faith. They don't actually possess saving faith. And he says, I need you to be alert to this danger. Because the ultimate test of whether or not your faith is saving faith is your perseverance. And if you do not persevere, then you do not have saving faith. So be warned. Be warned. But he says, even though I have to give you this warning, I'm confident of better things in your case. And he pivots to the positive to give encouragement to persevere. We've got to hear the warning. This is a real and present danger. But now there is great encouragement to continue. To continue. And so in verses 13 to 20, he's piling on encouragement after encouragement to keep at it, to persevere, to not give up, to say that God's promises are worth it. I know your present realities are troublesome and you think you can't keep going, but I'm telling you it's worth it because God has promised a rest for his people. He's promised a day wherein there is no more death, there are no more tears, there is no more disease, when the troubles of this life are no more and those who persevere will inherit what God has promised. He says this hope is real. It's guaranteed by the Word of God twice over. 
twice over. Guaranteed twice over. So let's hear these encouragements. And even long after this sermon concludes, I hope that you will recall these verses, that you will turn to them over and over again in your times of discouragement and despair, to be encouraged by the Word of God. Now to see where verse 13 picks up, look at verse 11. He says, We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end, so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. And so he goes immediately from chapter 12 and describing those who inherited to giving an example. And this is where we pick up our reading at verse 13. Verse 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we, who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us, may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So what are these encouragements to persevere? Here's the first one. God has given us an example to imitate. God has given us an example to imitate. As he says in verse 12, we do not want you to become lazy or sluggish or dull of hearing. We don't want that for you. We want you to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. And then he gives an example of someone who inherited what was promised. He goes straight to Father Abraham. Abraham, to whom God swore, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And Abraham waited patiently and he received what was promised. But what is encapsulated in these two verses is something we need to spend some time dwelling on. Because there's a lot of context that the author can assume among his audience that I can't necessarily assume today. These verses are coming from Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. And this is the famous passage where God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his son. And what makes that chapter so astounding is that God has told Abraham repeatedly that he's going to bless him, that he's going to make a great nation out of him, that he's going to bless the nations through his seed. And he's told him, it's going to be your own son, your own flesh and blood. He's told him that repeatedly. And he's told Abraham that when Abraham is already 75 years old. Far beyond childbearing age. This is impossible. 
As Paul says in Romans 4, it's, as, it's like his body's as good as dead. This is impossible. And yet God promised, you will have a son. And at various times, Abraham is confused about this, doubts, about, doubts God, questions God. How is this going to be? And God says, you, your own son, your own flesh and blood is going to inherit this promise. You're going to see this in your own family. Well, after 25 years, 25 years, Isaac, the child of the promise, is born. So just be reminded of that when you're praying for something and you're wondering, when am I going to see an answer? When when am I going to get some confirmation on this? Abraham waited 25 years before Isaac was born. Well, as if that were not enough, after Isaac is born, God came again to Abraham and says this in Genesis 22. Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. What? After all this build up, he's waiting 25 years for this child, and God says, take him. And just to make sure he knows exactly who's being talked about. Your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. That's the one. Take him and sacrifice him. Now what do you think Abraham would have done? God, you lied to me. You promised this child to me, and now you want me to sacrifice him? What? God, you're not just. You're not righteous. You lied. You sold me a bill of goods. But that's not what Abraham says. That's not what Abraham did. Early in the morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Notice very carefully what he says next. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Who will come back? We. Now, isn't that interesting? After he's taking his son up the mountain, God said, sacrifice him, and he tells his servants, we will be back. We will be back. What is going on here? Well, Hebrews 11 tells us exactly what's going on here. By faith, this is Hebrews 11, verse 17, by faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. He reasoned that even if I kill Isaac, God can raise him from the dead. And you probably know the rest of the story. Just as he raises the knife to sacrifice his one and only son, whom he loves, Isaac, God sends his angel to say, Stop! Don't do it! Don't do it! Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And God provides a ram as a substitute for Isaac. And then we have the promise that's repeated here in Hebrews 6. 
I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Do you need encouragement to persevere? Are you wondering if Jesus is worth it? Are, are you wondering if your time might be better spent sleeping in on a Sunday morning? And maybe living on mission for God is not worth it. It's not worth the cost. Maybe you're wondering if your money could be better invested elsewhere. Remember Abraham. We have an example to imitate. If it takes 25 years, so be it. If the thing that you've been waiting on is taken away, so be it. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Can you say that? Can you wait patiently? Is your hope that secure? Looking to the future. It's been said that hope is faith looking to the future. Hope is faith looking to the future. Trusting in what your eyes can't see now, but that God has nevertheless promised. This is a necessary ingredient to perseverance. Do you have it? Are you ready to imitate Abraham? Well, here's the second encouragement. We have an oath to end all argument. We have an oath to end all argument. The writer makes a parallel comparison to when people make oaths, when they swear things. Verse 16, people swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all, all argument. We see this all the time. Why? Because human beings in general are not trustworthy. How can I believe what you're saying? Can you guarantee that? Just look at what's happening in the banking industry right now. Can you guarantee that investment? Is it FDIC insured or not? We want to know, can we count on it? Can we trust it? Can I trust your word? Put your hand on a Bible to confirm it. Recognize some higher power. Do you promise? Do you promise? We want to hear that before we really believe it. And once we hear it, to our satisfaction, okay, you promised, you're swearing on a Bible, okay, I, I got to take your word for it at that point. That ends all argument. No, no more disputing over that. Okay. And God, because there's no one higher than him, swears by himself. He puts his own character on the line to confirm this promise to Abraham and to all of God's people. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear. He wanted to guarantee it. He wanted to make it convincing to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God didn't have to do this. God is as good as his word. When he says something, it will happen. God is not a human being that he should lie. When he says something, he'll do it. He's not a liar. He can't lie. He always tells the truth. But he knows us. He knows me. He knows we're doubtful. He knows we need confirmation. He knows we want guarantees. So he confirms it with an oath. I swear by myself. This will happen. And if you read carefully, you'll see that the writer of Hebrews is drawing upon scriptures where God says this very thing. He's shown this, for example, in drawing on Psalm 95 and Hebrews 4, verse 3. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. 
speaking to the rebellious wilderness generation. So also when he draws on Psalm 110 to say that Jesus is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Prior to that, he says, I swear, I have sworn you are a priest forever. He confirms it with an oath. And so also here, drawing on Genesis 22, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. I swear by myself. God's own character is at stake in his promises. This is guaranteed twice over. These two unchangeable things are, number one, his promise. His promise. I will do this. Number two, his oath to guarantee it. His oath to guarantee it. Do you need any more encouragement? This is an oath to end all argument. God said it. Can you leave it with him? Even when you don't see the evidence. Even when it takes 25 years. Even when you don't feel like it. Praise God that his promises don't depend on our feelings. His promises depend on his character. My feelings fluctuate day to day. Minute to minute. You know this. We know this about human experience. And so we can't ground our assurance and our perseverance on how we feel at any given moment. If you do that, be prepared for disappointment after disappointment. But if you're banking your hope on the character of God, you will never be disappointed. He cannot lie. He is just. He is holy. Leave it in His hands. Trust him. Persevere. Keep going. Don't give up. He's guaranteed it twice over. Here's the third encouragement. He says, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us can be greatly encouraged. We've fled to find refuge in God. Refuge from the world. Refuge from our sins and our guilt and our shame. And for those who find refuge in Him, for this, this hope set before them, they can be greatly encouraged. And we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. The third encouragement is, that, is this. We have an anchor to secure the soul. We have an anchor to secure the soul. Notice a few things about this. It's an anchor for the soul. The soul. What does he mean by the soul? He means our invisible, immaterial nature. Part of who we are that is joined to our body. Our soul. Our spiritual nature. The nature that makes us different from all of God's other creations and creatures. And this is an anchor for the soul. And this matters because what the world will tell us is that what you need to focus on fundamentally is your body. Your bodily needs. Your bodily wants. Attend to your body. Take care of your body. And that's not wrong. We should God has made us embodied creatures. But are you attending to your soul? Consider what Jesus says in Matthew 16. Verse 24. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And don't miss this. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or as it's been traditionally rendered, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? If you have everything, 
and you couldn't be more content in this world, but your soul isn't at peace with God, if your soul hasn't been saved by the blood of Jesus, if your soul doesn't know where to turn for hope, then what can the world do for you? Nothing. It's all a loss. Are you attending to your soul? We've been given an anchor for the soul. Whatever the world does to your body, they can kill you. They can steal your property. They can afflict you in various ways, but they can't touch your soul. But there is someone who can. And Jesus says we are to fear him. Don't fear those who can kill the body. Fear the one who can destroy body and soul in hell. Attend to your soul. Are you at peace with God? Do you turn to Him for assurance and hope when you're down and downcast? Under the stresses and the strains of life in this world, where do you turn? Oh, we, we have a, an anger for the soul here. Firm and secure. No matter what the storms of this life do, no matter how much they rage, this anchor will hold. Why? Why is it so secure? Look at where it is. Most anchors are dropped down. This is an anchor that goes up. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. What is that? He's describing the layout of the tabernacle and later the temple where God told his people there is to be an inner sanctum, a holy of holies. And that place symbolizes my most holy presence with you. And to demarcate that place, there is to be this curtain, a thick curtain that you cannot see through. You cannot see through this. This is the curtain that separates the rest of the tabernacle where others may go. But this Holy of Holies, only the high priest and only once a year may he enter in. But Hebrews 6 is saying that we have an anchor that's been dropped on the other side of that curtain. There is direct access to God Most High, the Holy One of Israel. That's why it's secure. If you drop your anchor anywhere else in this world, it won't hold. It's not secure. It's not firm. But because this anchor is in the Holy of Holies, oh, it's been guaranteed twice over. You can count on this. Is that where your anchor is? Notice the fourth encouragement. How does that anchor get there? Because we have a forerunner to pave the way. Verse 20. Where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. Our forerunner, the one who goes before us. He is the one who can pierce through that curtain. Quite literally, as you'll recall, at the death of Jesus, the curtain is torn from top to bottom, separating the Holy of Holies from the rest of the tabernacle. Now, now we have access. We can go with confidence, not timidly, but with boldness because of what Jesus has done. Because he's our forerunner. He's gone on. He's paved the way. How has he done this? He's done this by offering his righteous holy life, his blood in place of my unrighteousness and your unrighteousness. He's offered his life as an atoning sacrifice so that we can be forgiven for our sins. God can pour out his wrath against sin and pardon sinners. God can be just and justify Sinners. It's possible now 
Now, the righteousness of Christ can be given to you so that when you stand before the throne of God at Judgment Day, you don't have to be fearful because Jesus is your forerunner. He's gone on ahead. He's made a way. And His blood is sufficient. Do you need any more encouragement to keep going, to keep running, to not give up? We have an example to follow. Look to Abraham. Think on that. Meditate on Abraham and what he's done and the example he set. We have an oath to end all argument. No more disputing. We have an anchor for the soul. It will hold within the veil. And we have a forerunner who's paved the way. And here's what our forerunner has said. Hear these words. He says, My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the, pla- the way to the place where I am going. And as he says later, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the way. He is the one who's gone before. He is the forerunner. He has made a place for all of his people. Will you follow him there? Will you receive this offer for him to be your great high priest? Will you let his blood be sufficient for you? Will you drop anchor in the Holy of Holies to the high priestly work of Jesus? Because he's promised, I'm coming back. I've gone on to prepare a place. It's ready. It's already ready. Everything's already been done. And I'll come back for those who are trusting in me for salvation to take you to be with me forever. God has promised rest. No more tears. No more pain. No more death. No more fear. Perfect rest in the presence of God forever. Do you long for that? You can inherit that if that's your hope. If that's your hope. God's guaranteed it. There's no more argument on the side of God. The only question is, will we receive it? Will we take our stand on Christ, our solid rock? Or will we look to the world and shifting sand? Let's take our stand on Christ Let's take hold of the hope set before us and inherit eternal life. Amen. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we confess that on our own, we could never persevere. On our own, we would walk away. We would abandon you. We would be like those disciples when Jesus was arrested. We would abandon him. But we praise you, Father, that Jesus prays for his people, that he intercedes with you for us. And so we ask that the work of your Holy Spirit would be apparent in us today. That when we leave this place, We would be hopeful people. So hopeful, in fact, that those who know us, those who speak to us, those who hear from us, would be able to testify that we are hopeful people. Lord, may this be the case. Please empower us and equip us to be among those who persevere and inherit what you have promised. Father, we thank you for your great 
and precious promises. Promises that offer us a living hope through Jesus Christ, our Lord. May we receive it. May we hold on to it. And may it be an anchor for our souls. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.